Well, good morning, everybody. Real excited to be with you today. And today we're going to be wrapping up a series that we've been doing called The Salt Life. And in case you haven't been with us for the last three weeks, we've been talking about being salt and light in this world. You know, and maybe some of you, you hear this, you may be thinking, well, you know, pastor, that's easy for you. You work at a church, you know, you get to hold hands with the staff every day and sing kumbaya in the office as you're all walking around. But, you know, you may be thinking to yourself, but pastor, we have real jobs in our lives. We have real difficulty we have to experience. And if we try being salt and light in our workplace, you know, we possibly could lose our credibility, we could lose our friends, and most importantly, we could also lose our jobs. But listen, folks, as we discussed last week, Scripture teaches us that we are purposed by God to help people see Him. Therefore, because of this, we must leverage our own environments to reveal Christ in our lives. And our environments not only includes our home, it includes our neighborhood, but it includes our workplace. Now, we must understand that our faith is not something that we can compartmentalize. It's just not an at-church or at-home type of faith, but our faith, Faith must be everywhere and in everything we do. Now listen, folks. When we as a church began talking about God and his activity, an explosion of growth will happen. When we allow that to be a constant in our conversations, it is going to have an impact wherever you are. Now, the reason why is very simple. The reason why is because the Word of God tells us that Christ draws people to himself when the life-changing power of the gospel is preached to people. And when we do this, it is both personal and it's real. And when that happens, it can't help but make a difference in people's lives. Therefore, that's why the impact is going to happen. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus is talking to a group of what who they considered to be no one, I mean, nobodies. They had no power. They had no position. They had no prestige. And yet Jesus is talking to them to express their value in this world. And I want you to listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 5, uh, starting in verse number 14. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what this passage of Scripture teaches us is that light is strategically placed. You and I, we are strategically placed and so that people can see our good deeds. And through our good deeds, through our righteous activity, people are able to glorify our Father in heaven. And as I mentioned last week, when we live our lives in such a way, we literally help people connect the dots from our lives to God so that they will be able to see him and know him. Now, our workplace, our workplace can be one of the most difficult arenas in order to share the good news or share our faith. While at the same time, it may very well be the most important. You see, in our lives, we control who we socialize with. We control who we live with. But many of us can't control who we work with. And the only arena that some of your coworkers will ever have the opportunity to be able to experience Jesus and to know the working of God 
will be through your influence while you're at work with them. Now, for some, you may feel like, you know, Pastor, I just don't believe in mixing religion and faith with my work. You know, and I think that that's a personal and private thing. That's something I do on Sundays. And I just don't think that it's appropriate. And the reason people feel this way, honestly, the reason people feel this way is because you've likely been taught to compartmentalize your life. In fact, when you were hired in your job description, unless, of course, you are working at a church, it likely didn't say anything about you being salt and light in the world, did it? Of course it didn't do that. But yet, and you believe also at the same time that you were hired for a service, not a sermon, right? And I get that totally. We weren't hired by our employers, again, unless you're working in a church environment or ministry of some kind. If you're working out in the secular world, you weren't hired to preach a sermon at work. Yet I would venture to say that many of you who are watching today, if you are Christ followers, there's a good possibility that you are a follower of Christ today because of someone's influence on you at your place of employment or some type of capacity where you serve together. And that's why it serves as one of those important arenas for us to learn how to share our faith. Now, as this passage said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, it says that we are the light of the world. Therefore, our light is to be everywhere we are. And we are the way people find out what God is like. And so through our lives, we help people connect the dots to God. We have opportunities in our workplace to be instruments of righteousness that through our character and through the righteous acts of our lives, we reveal God to them. So the question I think I just want to pose here today is how can we be light in the marketplace or in our place of employment? You see, our goal is not to try to force people to believe something they don't want to believe. But our goal is is to introduce people to our Heavenly Father because it's personal and because it's real. So because of that, first thing that we need to do is that we need to learn to listen to people's stories. Now, if you are preparing in your activity at your job, remember this is really not about you when you're trying to engage someone. You're just not trying to just fill them with your story. You need to pay close attention to the stories that they're telling. I remember one of my favorite passages of scriptures is found in the gospel of Matthew chapter 8. Starting in verse number 5, it's Jesus, his experience with the centurion. It says, and when the centurion had entered Capernaum, or when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, shall I come to heal him? And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, and he said to those following, Truly I tell you, I have have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And listen to this. He said, Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done as you believed it would. And the servant was healed in that moment. I just love that because Jesus took the time to listen to the heart of this centurion and we have to do the same. 
And as you listen to someone's story, eventually there will be a connecting point between their story and your story. And that's why, you know, James tells us that we need to be slow to speak and quick to listen. We need to allow people to share as much as they possibly can until their story begins to connect and intersect with our own. And so when that happens, then we have that opportunity to speak into that moment. But as you listen to people share, you're able to pick up on their worldview. You're able to pick up on exactly what they think. And their worldview and how they see things are built on their beliefs and experiences as well as their hopes and their dreams. And for those outside of Christ, they know and realize that there is a gap in their story that doesn't make sense to them. And as you listen, as you learn, as you discover, you're going to see this gap. And when you find that gap and you know where they're struggling, that is our doorway to be able to step in and help speak life in the people's situation and lives. And you see, what we can do in that situation when it happens, that's when we can simply say something like, well, you know, that happened to me and here's what I did or here's how I was able to get through that. But the key to this is making sure that you spend time to listen. A second thing that we can do is take the time to ask specific questions. In other words, a question you might ask is, you know, hey, you know, what to you, what's the meaning of life? And boy, that's an open-ended question, and it can really start getting out to a lot of areas. But listen, folks, let people talk. Let them tell you what their thoughts are and listen for that moment when their story their, and yours can intersect, and that's your doorway in. You know, one thing that I learned years ago in the questions uh, I learned this, and I've used this countless times in my life in sharing my faith and really trying to help people understand where they are and how they can get toward Christ, you know, get connected to him. And I would start out by just simply asking the people, do they have any kind of spiritual belief? And you have to just be willing to sit there and listen and let them answer. And then after that, I may proceed with another question. And if they allow you to answer or ask another question, then that means they're giving you permission to do so. And my next question I ask them is simply, you know, to you, who is Jesus? And again, you listen. You just allow people to talk to your and answer the question that you're asking them. And then if they're Willing to continue to listen, you ask them another one. And that next question would be, do you believe in a heaven or hell? And let them talk. Let them, you know, let them speak into that. Then my next question would be, you know, and if they let me ask it, they're giving me permission. And if, they, if I would say, you know, hey, if you died right now, where would you go? You know, you, if you believe in a heaven or hell, if you died right now, where would you go? Now, again, all of this is them giving you basically permission to keep going. If they don't, then you stop the conversation. Don't try to force anything. But ultimately, if they say things that you know are not really true, aren't really right, I usually follow up with this one last question. And that question is, if what you've just shared with me were not true, would you want to know it? Now, if they say yes, and literally most people do, that is your doorway to enter in and to speak in to their life in order to share Christ with them that they may know him. But the thing of it is, is that you must have permission. And as long as people give you permission, then keep asking questions. And the more that you learn about them, the more you're able to speak in to their situation and in their lives. The Bible tells us this in the book of Acts chapter 8. 
You can look there, but there's a couple of passages I want us to notice, particularly in verse uh, number 30. And we're talking about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip was, you know, moved by the Spirit of God to, to, to go up to this chariot. And it says in verse 30, it says, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked this question. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. And it's really amazing what the guy said. And, you know, he said, well, how can I unless someone explain it to me? And so I just want to encourage you to prayerfully consider a non-threatening and open-ended question that might open the door for a great possible life-changing conversation with someone. And as long as people are giving you permission, as long as people are answering your questions, take that precious time to listen to what they're saying so that you know how you can best speak into their life. Thirdly, is I want to encourage everyone to pray for the people that you work with. You see, folks, when you begin to pray for someone by name, specifically by their name, what will begin to happen is that you will begin to develop a burden for that person in your mind, in your heart. And the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse number 2, it says, carry each other's burdens, and then this way you fulfill the law of Christ. Folks, you listen to what people talk about, and you pray about it. You know, you may be in the cafeteria, lunchroom, whatever, break room or whatever at your job and, and you're just listening to people talk and if you listen attentively, you're able to pick up on the things they're celebrating. You're able to pick up on the things that are causing difficulty in, at home or, or in their relationship and a lot of different things and it gives you something to pray specifically about. And as you are sensitive to these things, you're going to become a lot more aware of these doorways that I've spoken about and how you can speak into that situation in their life. Now, folks, here's what I know through all these years. It blows people away, especially when they're not believers, people who are not Christ followers. It literally blows them away when you tell them that you're praying for them and especially when you tell them what specifically you're praying for them about. Because what it communicates to them is that you've taken the time to take interest in their life and you're concerned about that and they know that you're genuine and you're real. Now folks, listen, we have to make our sharing of our faith with others very personal and real. And that means setting ourselves aside, listening attentively to what people are saying, ask good questions, and pray for people so that we will be able to leverage our, not only our wisdom, but most importantly, the power and the wisdom of God to work mightily in their lives. Now the fourth thing I want to mention today is I want to encourage everyone to address people's emotions. Now, it may be physical, it may be marital, parental, uh, it may be financial in nature, but people have a lot of emotions stirring inside of them because of these things and so many others. And what the tendency is for so many people is the tendency is to back away from those situations and even say to ourselves, you know, I really need to not get involved in this. But folks, we need to understand that if people are sharing and showing their emotions, especially men, if men or women are sharing their emotions and they're talking about the things that are really hurting them inside. Let me tell you, folks, brokenness exists. And when brokenness exists, it is an invitation to speak into their needs, not to avoid them. We need to realize that we need to leverage our lives. We need to leverage the power and the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ in moments when people are expressing their deepest needs. This is one of those doorways that I'm talking about. And it's in this, in this moment, in these times, 
that we have an opportunity to extend grace and mercy to people, compassion and love. Now, there's a passage of Scripture that reminds us of this important truth. It's found in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse number 14. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Just so or just as Christ has done this for us, now we go and do likewise for people so that they may experience the grace and mercy of Christ in their lives. And we have the answer through the power of the gospel to help bring about a change. You see, folks, as we've talked about, we are to be the light of the world. And to be the light of the world or to be the salt of the earth, that means that we are preserving agents. We are an intentional, strategic plan by God to reveal God to people. We need to help people see and know God through our righteous activity. Now listen, folks. Our activity is not to be confrontational. Our activity in expressing the love and grace of God and the activity of God is conversational. It is when we listen, it is when we take that time to just uh, take in everything that people are saying and then speak into their lives through our own experiences, through those doorways that open up in those conversations. Again, our objective, folks, is very simple. And that is to help people know our Heavenly Father. That is my encouragement to you. I just pray that you will allow the Word of God to just move your heart. Realize that you're valuable, you're significant, and God has a significant purpose in your life. That you are to be the salt of the earth. That you are to be a preserving factor in the world in which you live in all of those environments. Just as you are to be a light intentionally, strategically revealing the nature and the love of our Heavenly Father. And so my last encouragement to you is to stay salty, my friends. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We give you praise, and we thank you so much for being our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We hope that you'll continue in your time of worship to God by taking communion as a family. Let's do this in remembrance of Jesus. you to take a few moments to worship through giving. You can bring a check or cash to the office. You can give online at fccclearwater.org, click give, or you can text any dollar amount to 84321. We look forward to seeing you next week, church family. Love y'all.